this lesson, we'll take a closer look at some of the most common toxidromes associated with injurious plants. We'll also review the chemistry of poisons and explore how different chemical classes are tied to certain types of toxidromes. As we learned in our previous lesson on poisons, allergens, and teratogens in history, the line between poison and medicine is dependent upon dose and intent. Indeed, most drugs have the potential to also be poisons, and the doses that differentiate between poison and medicine can also vary from human to human. Factors like age, health status, and body weight can all influence how your body reacts to different drugs. From a pharmacological perspective, the therapeutic action of a drug can be grouped into one of the following three categories. Subtherapeutic, meaning that the dose is too low to yield any notable therapeutic benefit. Therapeutic, referring to a dose that is appropriate for yielding a therapeutic action in that particular patient. And supertherapeutic, in which the dose is too high and could lead to specific types of toxidromes or a syndrome caused by dangerous levels of a drug or toxin in the body. Toxidromes are clinical syndromes that are essential for the successful recognition of certain poisoning patterns. A constellation of signs and symptoms that suggest a specific class of poisoning. In a clinical setting, the most important toxidromes are the sympathomimetic, sedative hypnotic, opioid, anticholinergic, and cholinergic. We'll review the symptoms affiliated with each of these categories next. Let's begin with the sympathomimetic, also known as the adrenergic or stimulant toxidrome. The symptoms of this toxidrome include agitation, tremors, and delirium, mydriasis or dilation of the eye's pupils, increased heart rate, hypertension or high blood pressure, high respiratory rate, and fever, diaphoresis, which means sweating, and increased bowel motility and seizures. There are many different compounds that can cause this toxidrome, many of which are derived from plants or are based on chemical scaffolds originally discovered in plants. For example, we have cocaine from the coca plant, ephedra alkaloids from the traditional Chinese medicine ma huang or ephedra, synthetic bath salts which were modeled after cathionine alkaloids found in the North African and Middle Eastern plant kat, and then many different sources of caffeine and other xanthine alkaloids from coffee, tea, yerba mate, and chocolate. The next toxidrome is that of the anticholinergic toxidrome. The symptoms of this one include agitated mental status, mydriasis or dilated pupils, increased heart rate, blood pressure, respiratory rate and temperature, flushed red skin, dry mucous membranes, decreased bowel motility, urinary retention, and seizures. A good way to remember this constellation of symptoms is the phrase, hot as a hair, dry as a bone, red as a beet, mad as a hatter. There are a number of compounds that can cause this toxidrome, and they also come from the plant kingdom. This includes compounds like atropine and scopolamine, which are the major offenders from the Solanaceae family, especially from Belladonna, the deadly nightshade. You may have also noted that these symptoms of the anticholinergic and the sympathomimetic toxidromes are very similar. Both have fever, tachycardia, hypertension, mydriasis, and mental status changes. The difference is that the anticholinergic patient has dry, red, or flushed skin, constipation, and delirium, while the sympathomimetic patient has pale, diaphoretic skin increased gastrointestinal motility, and is typically agitated. Next, let's go over the cholinergic toxidrome. The symptoms here include drooling, diaphoresis, and diarrhea, urination, meiosis or constricted pupils, spasms and contractions of the lungs, excessive discharge of watery mucus for the lungs, emesis or vomiting and nausea, lacrimation or crying, seizures, excessive salivation, muscle weakness, and respiratory arrest. 
A good way to remember the constellation of symptoms for this toxidrome is the acronym SLUDGE, which stands for salivation, lacrimation, urination, defecation, GI distress, and emesis. Basically, patients with this toxidrome are leaking all over their body, and this is in sharp contrast to the dry state of symptoms seen in the anticholinergic syndrome patients. Some of the plants and plant compounds associated with this toxidrome include nicotine from tobacco plants, physostigmine from the calabar bean, and pyocarpine from jabirandi. Other well-known causes of this toxidrome include nerve agents like sarin and somin, as well as insecticides of the carbamate and organophosphate classes. Next, we have the opioid toxidrome, and the symptoms here include central nervous system depression, meiosis or constriction of the pupils, and respiratory depression. The major natural source of compounds for this toxidrome is the opium poppy, which contains opiate alkaloids like morphine and codeine, as well as serves as the basis for the production of many different chemical derivatives ranging from heroin to tramadol. Next, we have the sedative hypnotic toxidrome. The symptoms here include confusion, delirium, somnolescence, stupor, and coma, diplopia, or the perception of two images of a single object, nystigmus, which is a condition of the eyes where they make repetitive, uncontrolled movements, and ataxia, which resembles the symptoms of someone that's really drunk. They have slurred speech, stumbling, they're falling, have a loss of coordinated movement. There's also a potential for respiratory depression or hypotension with either a large or a multiple substance ingestion. Some of the major causes of the sedative hypnotic toxidrome include antiepileptics, antipsychotics, barbiturates, benzodiazepines, and ethanol. Note that many different plant species are used to make ethanolic-based beverages in the form of wines, beer, and spirits. You may have noted that the opioid and sedative hypnotic toxidromes are very similar. The differences here are that the opioid toxidrome has meiosis or constricted pupils and a lower respiratory rate, while the sedative hypnotic toxidrome patient may have any size pupils and rarely has a lower respiratory rate. Now that you have a good grasp on some of the major toxidromes, we're going to dive into some of the plant chemistry behind these and other common plant poisoning symptoms. If you haven't seen the lessons yet on natural products chemistry, you should definitely review those before diving into this material. Here we have alkaloids, which can fit into different toxidromes that I just covered. These are nitrogen-bearing compounds with a cyclic scaffold, and these often impact the central nervous system. One class of alkaloids, the pyrrolizidine alkaloids, can also do some serious damage to the liver. Next, we have cardiac glycosides. As the name suggests, these impact the heart tissues. Cyanogenic glycosides, on the other hand, can yield hydrogen cyanide when they're broken down, and at high enough levels can actually cause cyanide poisoning. Anthroquinone glycosides have purgative activities, causing GI distress and diarrhea. Saponin glycosides can also be irritating to the gut and even toxic to fish. These derive their name from saponin, from the production of bubbles, like soaps, when they're exposed to water. You may have seen this effect when washing your lentils before cooking them, as the natural saponins are rinsed off. Next, we have the coumarin glycosides. While not very common, they can interfere with thyroid function. And then there are the general group of plant resins. Resins can be very dangerous because they represent a concentrated version of the plant's chemistry and in some cases, the plant's poison. Sometimes these are linked to contact dermatitis, for example, in the case of poison ivy, and in other cases, consumption of certain plant resins can prove deadly. For example, water hemlocks, which are cicuta species found in the carrot or apiaceae family. Plant lectins are proteins found in certain plants, and these can be incredibly toxic. Examples include ricin and abrin. Oxalates, on the other hand, are compounds found commonly in many house plants. 
The calcium oxalate crystals in these species can be highly irritating to the mucous membranes. Lastly, we should also note that some plants can accumulate certain harmful elements from the soil into their plant tissues, such as mercury, which can cause poisoning from those toxic substances. Okay, now let's review some common sources of these toxic plant compounds, beginning with the cyanogenic glycosides. These are commonly found in the Rosaceae, Fabaceae, Poaceae, and Euphorbiaceae families. Note that the compounds are not equally distributed in all plant tissues of the same plant. For example, apple seeds have cyanogenic glycoside, amygdalin, but the tasty fruit tissues that we eat doesn't. If sufficient levels of hydrogen cyanide are released into the body through consumption of cyanogenic glycoside bearing plant parts, the symptoms are typical of those of cyanide poisoning and include the following possible outcomes. Patients may experience overall weakness, nausea, confusion, headache, difficulty breathing, seizures, loss of consciousness, and even cardiac arrest. Acute poisoning events have immediate effects, whereas chronic poisoning takes place over longer periods of time with blue lips, changes in breathing rates, and more. Now let's go over saponins. Some of the major symptoms of saponin poisoning can include abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and skin irritation. Certain foods, such as lentils, do have saponins present, but these are at very low levels, not typically associated with poisoning symptoms. Saponins are typically bitter in taste and when combined with water, yield bubbles. They are also found in a number of medicinal plants, such as licorice and ginseng. Now, with, with regards to coumarin glycosides, consumption of plants rich in coumarin glycosides can actually lead to issues with blood clotting. And this is a particular problem for grazing livestock like cattle that are eating sweet clover and can lead to hemorrhaging in mild cases or even death in severe cases. Some plants contain sharp, tiny crystals in their juices, leaves, and stems, and these are called calcium oxalate crystals. Oxalate crystals can cause intense pain and swelling if they come in contact with the skin or mouth. When ingested, tiny crystals irritate the mucous membrane, creating the sensation of chewing on ground glass. Pain in the mouth and tongue, difficulty swallowing, swelling, and temporary hoarseness can occur. In extreme cases, severe swelling can block the entranceway to the respiratory passages, putting patients at risk of death due to asphyxiation. Exposure of the plant juices to the skin can also cause local irritation. Now let's cover lectins. Lectins are plant proteins, and they have a great capacity to cause serious symptoms and even death. A good example is the lectin ricin, which is derived from the seeds of the castor bean plant, Ricinus communis, of the Euphorbiaceae family. It is incredibly potent and only takes the equivalent of a few grains of salt worth of the purified protein to kill an adult human. There are also a number of other biological poisons that are important to human health. These are found in diverse sources, ranging from bacteria, algae, fungi, ferns, and fern allies. You may be wondering about the main reasons that plant poisonings occur. While they can be intentional and criminal acts, most cases are actually due to cases of mistaken identity when people forage wild ingredients or from children and pets who eat common plants found in the home and landscaping. When my children were little, they had two major rules they had to recite to me when playing outside. Number one, don't talk to strangers. And number two, don't put any of the plants they found in their mouths. You might be surprised at just how many common houseplants are rich in highly irritant calcium oxalates or other poisons that can harm pets and young children. It's important to investigate the risks in your own household to keep everyone safe. Lastly, it's important to note that not all plants are poisons. Some can even serve as antidotes to poisons. A great example of this is that of the milk thistle, scientifically known as Syllabum marianum in the Asteraceae or Compositae family. 
A mixture of compounds from the plant known as silymarin can suppress the liver destroying actions of the deadly death cap mushroom. Milk thistle is also an important traditional medicine throughout the Mediterranean where it grows in the wild. In this lesson, we've covered a lot of ground when it comes to recognizing the telltale signs and constellations of symptoms specific to the most common toxidromes. In the next lesson, we'll go into more examples of specific plants associated with certain toxidromes. For now, take some time to study these different toxidromes and the symptoms of some major classes of plant poisons. This will come in handy as we learn more about the medical potential of certain poisonous plants.